mic out to CTC, but as I do that, I'm just going to welcome you to our Yukon Chamber of Commerce luncheon. If you haven't already uh, picked up lunch, make sure you grab it. We, we're right on schedule. We're quite efficient today, so that'll give us more time to spend with our speakers. How am I doing, CBC? Is that all right? Okay. So we're going to do a little mic transfer here in a minute. Um, but I would just like again like to say thank you for coming out to support the Chamber and thank you for coming out to hear uh, our speakers today. We, we know that um, the issue of oil and gas development in the Yukon is uh, one that concerns a lot of people and also interests and excites a lot of people in terms of business development. I think in the Yukon it's fair to say that in terms of industrial development we're pretty comfortable in, in most regards with how mining works. But we really don't have a lot of experience with oil and gas. Uh, although we do have two um, businesses that have invested in the territory in the oil and gas sector. One is Northern Cross in North Yukon, and uh, the recent owners of the Cotoneely fields in Southeast Yukon, and their name is EFLO. So those are two active companies. There's other companies that have done some exploration work as well. Uh, so in regards to that, we're uh, the idea of the Chamber Lunch and our Energy Talk Series, and the Energy Talk Series are uh, every Wednesday just about, and they're more of a brown bag lunch event. Uh, the, that, that series and the two talks um, so far that we've done on the oil and gas sector are to open up that conversation. And um, I'm happy to say that that has created a lot of, of great uh, dialogue in the community. I'm going to hand the mic over then to Peter. He's going to make a few announcements, um, and then I will introduce our speakers. Thanks, Daryl. Welcome and uh, Happy New Year to everyone here today. Um, I just want to speak very briefly on the Frozen Globes Business Awards, uh, which we've been acting as point people for here in the Yukon. This is the Up North Magazine Annual Business Awards, uh, and uh, today is actually the last day to vote for the uh, nominees, so if you get a chance this afternoon to get online at frozenglobes.ca, uh, please uh, vote for uh, your favorite Yukon business that's listed there. And then uh, the, the gala awards ceremony is going to be here at the High Country Inn next Thursday evening, on, uh, that's the 23rd of January, and uh, there's going to be live music and, uh, and a good representation of northern businesses from across the three territories uh, that will be recognized, uh, as well as a lot of uh, local folks, so it's a chance to serve dress up and uh, you know, have a great dinner and uh, there'll be live music and uh, all sorts of stuff going on. If you're interested in that, uh, the tickets are available at the Frozen Globes uh, website, which is frozenglobes.ca. Uh, I'll pass the microphone back to uh, Derry Hall, the chair of our energy committee, and uh, she'll introduce our speakers today. Thanks for coming out. Okay, and also just uh, again, welcome to everybody. I'd like to make a special note that we have Minister Kent here, our Minister of Energy, Mines and Resources. We have Lois Moorcroft here with the NDP, John Treasurer, and Kate White. I don't think there's any other dignitaries here. Uh, so with that, I will introduce our speaker. We have actually two speakers. We're lucky to have two speakers today. Uh, we have Aaron Miller with the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, and John Hope with uh, MGM, which is a uh, oil and gas company that's doing work in the Northwest Territories. So, I'm going to attempt a paperless introduction. Aaron has been in the upstream oil and gas sector for 14 years, where he spent several years at some of the sector's flagship companies, working in a variety of analytical roles in operations. Simultaneously, Aaron has been engaged in public policy on the federal, provincial, territorial, and municipal spheres and has worked on a variety of campaigns on the national, provincial, and local, of, of local nature. Since 2012, Aaron has been at the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, CAP, where he is currently manager of Northern Canada, of the Northern Canada Policy and Environment Group. Aaron has a Bachelor's of Commerce and also a degree in Political Science with a focus on Canadian federalism and the Constitution. Outside of work, Aaron's biggest passion is helping people in the community through his variety of volunteer endeavors as he is involved in various nonprofit boards and committees. He is a past chairman of the Calgary Stampede Youth Speech and Debate Committee, which develops leadership and confidence in youth by ways of public speaking on agricultural issues and the environment. 
Aaron was recognized for his community work as he was named to Avenue Magazine's Top 40 Under 40 in 2011, and in 2012, he was the recipient of the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal. I'll also just do um, John here. Maybe I'll do John once John's turn. <laughs> I've got to pull it up. Okay, so please help me welcome Aaron to the stage. Thank you for that very kind introduction, Dariel. And uh, we flew in on, on Wednesday, or sorry, Monday. We're leaving today, and it's been a great, a great couple of days here. I certainly wish we had more time. And let, let me start by saying thank you to the, the Yukon Chamber of Commerce um, at CAP and, and uh, our member companies. Uh, we, we get to travel the, the country from you know coast to coast to coast. And I've had the pleasure and honor of speaking at a lot of chambers, but uh, I have to say, I have never seen a, a chamber that is more hands-on and friendly and um, just rolling out the carpet for us. So uh, a huge thank you to, to Peter, to, to Carla, and, and to Dariel. So join me in thanking them. So today we're going to we're gonna talk, uh, I'm going to kick things off telling you a little bit about CAP, who we are and what we do, what we represent, and sort of the the footprint we have around the country here. And then um, a uh, key CAP member from, from our organization, uh, John Hope from MGM Energy, is going to then take that to a little more granular level and, and talk about what, what industry, what exploration looks like uh, north of 60, as they are, MGM's our flagship company in the north, as they're very active in the exploration sphere in uh, the Northwest Territories. So, let me start by just basically going over what I'm going to talk about today. And I, as I've said to a, a few of you earlier on, uh, I'm going to try to keep mine as short as possible so as to uh, open up the floor for, for lo lots of Q&A, because to me that's, that's the best part, and I, and I look forward to uh, questions from, from all of you. So I, I'm going to go over the you know, supply and demand of, of energy from the IEA as they, they project out to uh, 2035. I'm going to go over that quickly. I'm going to talk about the, the Canadian natural gas industry in a global context. Uh, the economic impact, of course, is, is, is a big one. And not only impacts today, but uh, the impact that's going to have tomorrow. As, it, as it, a lot of the studies that have been done here in Canada by sources such as the Conference Board of Canada really segue nicely and emanate from um, the global energy outlooks that we're seeing from uh, the global organizations like the IEA. And then we're going to you know, dr drill down a little bit more here, Par pardon the pun. Um, we're going to look at uh, you know, issues more germane to the north and then take that a little further and, and talk about uh, well, what's the potential for the Yukon as you guys uh, look at uh, potential for natural gas develop development and, and are deciding on your future here in terms of the industry. And we're, we're going to address some, some of the big issues that uh, people are concerned with, which you can probably all guess at. I won't have to go into detail there yet. And what, again, what industry is doing to address those concerns? And, you know, last, um, look at the opportunities and the challenges in the Yukon here. And then I will pass it over to John to give you a, a, a territory example from your neighbor. Okay, well, let's start, again, CAP, we're the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. Um, again, with the uh, very, very small imprint up here, you, you're probably maybe not that familiar um, with our organization. So we represent roughly, I guess it's a little over 90% of all the oil and gas produced in Canada. Um, they're members of CAP. And we have over, over uh, about 100 members now, more or less. And I'm uh, very, very proud to, to say that uh, the company doing some um, early seismic and exploration work here in the Yukon, Northern Cross, uh, has become a member of CAP uh, around June of last year. So our mission, we again, we we engage and advocate so on behalf of the industry to governments, stakeholders, public, and and the whole the, the whole nine yards. And our goal is to is to engage and, and to make sure the industry moves forward in uh, an environmentally and economically sustainable matter for for the long term. Now, as I alluded to at the beginning, let's let's look at the 
from 2013, the International Energy Agency, the IEA, that I referred to. This is a recent slide, and again, they're a global organization, a global um, energy um, center for, for studies and, and forecasts. Now, if you look here, what you can draw some very, very good inferences here. Again, if you look out um, to 2035, and you look at the color codes, uh, the, the corollary, the, the, the assumptions, not just assumptions, conclusions here are fossil fuels are going to continue to play a, a pretty prevalent role um, in, in the future in our, in our energy um, uh, portfolio. And you can also see um, in, in step with that, uh, renewables will also be playing a, uh, an increasing role as they expand and um, become a more prevalent piece of the uh, energy, energy mix. So again, you'll see with population growth and there, there will be an ongoing high reliance on hydrocarbons, again, increasing role for renewables and a shift from non-conventional to you know, conventional sources. Now, again, the, these are some very interesting uh, projections. And again, what does this say? It says, um, again, hydrocarbons will continue to, to play a pretty strong role. But we still must um, still must try to reduce our carbon footprint. And one of the ways that uh, we'll, we'll touch upon today, one of the ways to do that is to increase the, and expand the role of natural gas, which is by far the uh, cleanest burning uh, hydrocarbon. So let's talk, let's talk the industry in Canada here. The oil and gas industry in Canada is, it really is sort of the engine that drives the country in so many ways from, from coast to coast. It, um, again, as Canada is, is a resource extraction, industry-driven economy, and oil and gas really sort of uh, pulls the cart in many ways. If you look back to um, the recession that hit back in, the, I guess it really hit around first quarter, second quarter of 2008 there, well into 2009. One of the things that really buffered and, and buoyed Canada from feeling the full brunt of that, of that um, recession was, was there was continuing demand for, for our raw resources and obviously near the top of that list is uh, oil and gas. So again, as you can see, um, a pretty big chunk of our economy, and I, I really like this this slide here. You, you see it up against some of the other sort of flagship um, industries in Canada, whether it's auto manufacturing, forestry, logging, agriculture, etc. So again, it's a pretty key cog in our economy. It's again roughly 18% of, of our exports, and about 20% of the value of the Toronto Stock Exchange or, or oil and gas companies. And the employment numbers are quite staggering, staggering whether it's uh, direct, indirect, induced employment. Um, again, that's one thing people may not be aware of. Of all, primarily the production of oil and gas uh, occurs in Western Canada, but the, the benefits uh, cascade right through the, pro the country. So whether you're in you know, Burnaby, British Columbia, or, or Bathurst, New Brunswick, you are reaping the benefits of the industry, whether it's direct, indirect or induced from all the uh, vast array of ancillary services. And I got a, a couple slides later that uh, we'll go into this a bit more. And again, it's uh, another thing we have to remember is, is this, the industry is, it puts a lot of money in, in the uh, coffers of the government and that comes out in the form of uh, financing uh, social program, programs such as health and education and, and a, a wide variety of social programs that we all, that we all treasure and are a real staple and uh, backbone of the fabric of our society. So again, I always like this uh, slide because it, again, it, it really shows you how, how um, key the industry is. So let's move on here. Um, this was, again, just another snapshot of, of the impact of natural gas in Canada. This was, this was commissioned by, the research was done by the Conference Board of Canada back in 2012. And I'm not going to go into all the numbers there. Um, this slide will be on, on the website after anyway, if, if, you're, uh, if you're interested. But you can see there that despite the, the uh, vast majority of the natural gas production taking place in Western Canada, the, the benefits cascade right, right through the country. Um, and, and the numbers, again, are quite staggering. And the, the jobs that are, that are um, 
that are created and sustained for the long term. As the industry, as the conference board um, concluded from 2012 to 2035, I believe was their was their horizon. It you know it sustains about 260, it's just under 260 thousand jobs a year, both direct and indirect and induced. So again, that's it's a pretty compelling piece of um, uh, piece of information there that uh, really tells the story. Now let's um, let's maybe take this you know to the next level. Let's talk about the future of natural gas development. And as we all know, it's it's changed the last handful of years, half you know five half dozen years, as um, unconventional resources of uh, shale gas that before was was not accessible is now is now accessible, and it's really uh, created a shale boom. Not only in, in the United States but in Canada as well. As we all know, um, advances in horizontal drilling uh, fused with the uh, technology that's been around for a long time, hydraulic fracturing. So when you fuse those together, uh, it's really opened up a, a, a real opportunity set of, of resources and uh, affordable, cleaner burning fuel. So again, it's, we've seen a real a real paradigm shift in North America with, with natural gas. So, as I alluded to, the tried and tested, you know, uh, technology of hydraulic fracturing that's been around for a long time, for, for several decades. I, I love this slide too, it kind of gives you a, a glimpse of uh, some of the early fracturing. And again, with the, with the advances in technology and horizontal drilling, Again, the fusion of those two technologies has, has really, really created um, a lot of opportunity to, again, access resources that were not accessible in the past. Now, again, one of the big misconceptions that uh, we're going to talk about today, not just hearing from me, but when we open up the floor later for questions, um, and this is something I, I want to talk about, is one of the big misconceptions is uh, hydraulic fracturing is, is a new technology. And again, it's, it's not. It's been around for, for several decades, and we've uh, safely uh, fractured many, many wells. And let's look back at our environmental track record. Again, we've been fracturing in Western Canada for a long time, and we've, we've safely fractured uh, well over 175,000 wells without uh, contamination of, of drinking water. And again, look at that. Over 175,000 wells without any reported incidents of contaminating drinking water. And again, this, this is an environmental record that's, it, it doesn't get out there that much, and uh, you know, it's incumbent upon us to, to talk about this and to convey those facts. And again, not just Western Canada, but if you look at the roughly 50, I believe 49 fracturing operations that have occurred in New Brunswick, again, same thing, there's been no reported, confirmed cases of contamination to drinking water. And another key thing here, these stats are not coming from Canada. They're not coming from industry. They're coming from the provincial regulators in British Columbia and Alberta. Again, I can't stress that enough. These aren't num numbers that we cooked up. These are numbers from the provincial regulators. Now, another issue besides water that uh, we've been talking about a lot in the last couple of days, and uh, I would say this is probably probably we've heard this more than any other issue, is the GHG impact of, of natural gas. And there's, there's been a lot, of, uh, a lot of controversy, a lot of debate on this, and there's a, a wide body of, of research on this. But if, if you look, if you take a holistic look at the research and look at it in aggregate, the, the conclusions are quite compelling, actually. Again, let's start with the United States. Energy Information Agency um, back in, in 2012, that they, their CO2 emissions from energy, energy use is the lowest in 20 years. Again, I want you to stop and think about that for a minute. CO2 emissions from energy use, the lowest in 20, 20 years in the United States. And this isn't coming from industry. This isn't coming from CAP or our equivalent uh, organizations in the United States. This is coming from the EIA. Now, why, why are CO2 emissions the lowest in 20 years? 
And as you know, CO2 is one of the, the key uh, GHGs. And if you, uh, if you read the report the EIA released, and I, I can give you the link after if you're really interested, one of the key reasons was the move from coal to natural gas. And um, by virtue of, largely by virtue of the shale boom of the last uh, half dozen years. So again, that switch from, from coal to natural gas has resulted in, again, the lowest CO2 emissions in, in 20 years in the United States. And we all hear about how the shale gas extraction and production is, is very non-GHG friendly. But uh, when you hear that, I, I want you to stop and look at this and look at the body of evidence that is out there. And I, you can draw your own conclusions. And there's studies from the states and there's also, I mean, our own government has commissioned studies as well. Andrew can looked in to the um, comparison, not just coal versus natural gas, but they, they looked at um, the comparison of conventional natural gas versus shale gas and looked at the life cycle GHG impact. And their conclusion was quite compelling as well. They, they concluded that it was only slightly more intense, under 4%, 3.8% uh, higher than, than gas produced from, from natural, uh, or sorry, from, from conventional sources. And the key caveat proviso of that was it actually had nothing to do with the actual fracturing process and, and, the, um, and the flow back and whatnot. The reason why it was even 3.8% higher. And again, this is Entercam. This, this is our government who commissioned this study. Um, the reason why it was 3.8% higher was the higher CO2 content in that particular play in British Columbia, which was their case study. And again, if you're interested in this report or others that I cite throughout my presentation, I'd be very, very happy to, to um, address that and share it with you. And a lot of these reports, they, they directly refute some of the sort of flagship reports out there that, well, I would say primarily it's the uh, Howarth uh, Cornell study that uh, postulated that uh, shale gas was more GHG intense and not only conventional, but but uh, coal. But again, look at the evidence, look at the uh, compelling conclusions that the body of evidence um, um, states, and again, you can see for yourself. So let's move on here. Um, I want to go back to water. So again, as we've been talking the last couple of days, again, it's been largely around water and, and GHGs. And again, just wanted to, to share a couple a couple numbers with you here. Uh, let's start with this top one. Um, we hear all the time that uh, hydraulic fracturing operations use large volumes of water, and it can range anywhere from five thousand to a hundred thousand cubes of water for for a well. And it really depends on a variety of factors. It's the the big uh, discrepancy, you know, five to a hundred thousand. But the, uh, the BC Oil and Gas Commission, their, their latest data set um, from 2010, that's as current as they have right now, they looked at all the water authorizations from, from all sectors, from all industrial sectors, agriculture and, and everything. And you may find this interesting, but oil and gas industry accounted for less than 1% of all water authorizations. So again, the entire pie chart, the aggregate amount of authorized water use for all sectors, in that year, 2010, it was less than 1%. 0.6% of the oil and gas industry was responsible for. So yes, 5,000 to 100,000 cubes may sound like a lot of water, but when you compare it to other, other activities, it's actually not as intense as you may, as you may think. And if you want to take it a step further, um, the regulator just lumped together the oil and gas industry um, for the uh, 0.6. So if you wanted to get the pure fracturing uh, impact um, of water, um, it would be even less than 0.6. So again, be more than happy to share these sources and uh, talk about this uh, after if you're interested. And uh, another big issue is fracturing fluid itself. Um, I'm sure there's going to be some questions about that. 
Um, you know, fracturing fluid is anywhere from 98.5 to 99.5% water and sand, and, and the rest is uh, additives that are used as propens and whatnot to facilitate the process. But again, there's been, been a lot of concern about this as well, and we're going we're gonna to talk about this as, as we move on in the, uh, in the uh, program today. Now, there's, as we've been having a conversation in the last couple of days here, you know, it's, our, our environmental track record is, is very strong, but, you know, that, that's not enough these days. Um, we're, we are out there engaging the public, we're communicating, we are listening, we're doing events like this, and it, it's all about transparency and operations and investments in energy literacy, promoting technological advancements that are going to be uh, lessen our, our environmental impact. So industry is doing a lot, uh, again, not only obviously from, from CAP, but uh, more importantly, our member companies are investing a lot in whether it's um, you know, grain completions or, or uh, reusing and recycling water in their fracturing operations. We're, we're doing a lot to really lessen our impact. And I, I, really, I really encourage you to, to ask more questions and, and look at some of the things we're doing. They're, they're quite fascinating and quite compelling. Now, getting close to wrapping up here, let's talk a, a bit about operations uh, north of 60. Now, whether it's in the Yukon or, or the Northwest Territories, there's um, th there's a lot of there's a lot of potential up here, and it's um, you know it's a, it's an amazing place, and there's there's great resource uh, potential. Companies have allocated uh, capital to, to do exploration, and um, there, there's a lot of excitement. Whether it's uh, you know. Northwest Territories or Yukon now is, is now starting to garner some more attention. And there's also some obstacles too. There's, um, again, a lot of industrial activities north of 60. There's, there's infrastructure issues, workforce issues, um, market access issues with pipelines and whatnot. So there, there, there's opportunities and there's some obstacles too, but um, you know, in aggregate, it's, it's quite, quite an exciting time to, um, to really be up here right now. And again, I, I thank uh, thank the chamber, and I thank you for all for all coming as well. And before I hand it off to to John to sort of take it to the next level and, and show you show you literally, you know, physically what it looks like for for exploration in the north through their endeavors in the Northwest Territories, I want you to just sort of leave you with this and look at potential opportunities for the Yukon here. I mean, for firstly, we'll, you know, we'll touch upon government revenues, right, you know, through taxes and royalties. And again, whether it's uh, territories, provinces, or the federal government, uh, the industry does a lot to, to put um, funds into government coffers to, to fund key things such as uh, health and education. So, I mean, that's, that's a potential benefit that, that is there. Um, and again, and if you take that to the next level, you know, the social benefits, uh, jobs, increased standards of living, and again, um, just a general impact through the community where um, things become more vi vibrant. And another issue that uh, we've been talking about quite a bit uh, the last couple days is, is is a local, you know, made in Yukon energy supply. And there is um, that's the beauty of, of the natural gas uh, opportunity up here is there's the economic elements, but there, there's also the environmental opportunity here. You have an opportunity to potentially uh, produce, explore, and maybe produce some natural gas that again is going to have an economic uh, multiplier effect, but it's also going to lessen your GHG impact as it uh, can potentially replace more, more um, intense uh, fuel sources. So again, I want to leave you with that, and I think that's that's a perfect place to sort of segue and, and hand over to John, and I, I guess at this point I'll and it back to Daryl to introduce John. So thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions at the end. Thank you.